The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. One of the great watercolorists, Lauren McCracken, is going to give you a little bit of watercolor realism, glass and wood. Hello, I'm Lauren McCracken, and I'm an unabashed, realist watercolorist. My paintings are highly influenced by the 16th and 17th century Dutch and Flemish still life painters. I like the control that they have on the subject matter. I like the strong lighting. I also like the strong backgrounds in their paintings. While I paint a lot of things, I particularly like to paint still lifes. And a lot of people know my still lifes for the black backgrounds. Even though I don't always paint the black backgrounds, I am pretty partial to them. My favorite Dutch Flemish painter is, is a gentleman by the name of Willem Kalf, K-A-L-F. I encourage you to look up Mr. Kalf. He has fabulous realism. He has an interesting array of subjects that cover the history of the development of Amsterdam and that part of uh, what now we know as Holland and Flanders in that area. I set up my own still lifes, I photograph them, and then I set them aside. And sometimes it may be weeks, months, even years before they get painted. I take advantage of the opportunities that I have to have access to really fine subject matter such as other people's silver and crystal, but I don't know when I'm going to get around to painting them. I'm an architect and I suppose that has a lot to do with why I like to paint in realism because I remember in school and in 50 something years of practice that you needed to know about the details of the building at, at the same degree that you needed to know about the aesthetics, the, the rhythm, the siding, all of the aspects that go into creating the built environment. While being an architect explains a lot and a lot of people think that, oh, all the detail in my paintings comes from all those years of drawing all those details. However, the last 40 something years of my career, I was the guy in charge of marketing. In fact, I haven't had a drawing board in more than 40 years. But the year that I turned 60, I was living in Alexandria, Virginia, and I had an opportunity to take two six week classes with a pretty fabulous instructor at the Torpedo Factory there in Alexandria, Virginia, and it launched a second career for me. I had no idea that I could paint in watercolor because when I was in college, the semester I should have taken a watercolor class, I ended up taking a printmaking class. I have no regrets. I thoroughly enjoyed learning how to do etchings and lithographs and would do that again in a minute. But I'd spent all my career realizing there was a hole in my knowledge base and that was about watercolors. So I took the advantage of these classes and learned the fundamentals of watercolor. What I found out was the minute I wet a brush, it just came naturally to me. And while I had a good fundamentals, I continued to learn every day about the aspects of watercolor. And I have a feeling I'll spend the rest of my life 
learning about the techniques and the intricacies of painting, realism particularly, in watercolor. I believe there are three aspects of being an artist, and let me share those with you before we get started painting. Seeing is the first fundamental. Henry David Thoreau said, it doesn't matter what you look at, it's what you see that is important. That is true of every style of painting, but it is particularly true of realism. The second fundamental for me is drawing. Drawing is the fundamental of all art, has been for, since the beginning of time. And yes, you do need to know how to draw to do watercolor. The third, which is our subject for this video, is the mastery of the technique. And what we're going to be doing over the, the period of this video is I'm going to show you the techniques that I use to create my brand of realism. This video won't focus on seeing or drawing, but they will be fundamental to the process we go through in creating this still life painting. The goal of all this is not to paint a painting exactly like I'm going to paint, or to even do a painting that looks like a Lauren McCracken still life. The goal for you ought to be study these techniques, get familiar with them, and use them. And then, as you have a need through your painting career, you come up a, on an opportunity to do something and you say, gee, that looks like it's going to be something I'm not terribly familiar with. Then think about this video and say, ah, Warren showed me how to do that. And then you get to do that in a way you have tucked away in your bag of tricks. It'll make your painting a lot more fun and a lot more interesting. It's not important that you finish this painting, but it is important that you try all the techniques that I'm going to explain to you in the, the process of painting this still life, because you never know when you're going to need one of those techniques in the future. I hope you'll look back on this as an enjoyable experience and you'll say that uh, I had fun painting with Lauren McCracken and he taught me a lot of things. All right, let's get started. For most of my still life setups, I like to use a black background. That's not always true, but uh, uh, today we're going to use a black background so that later we can talk about how to paint that black background. Let me show you how to set up a still life, light it, and give you a few tips on how to turn out a real fine still life for a realist watercolor. Here I've got a very simple uh, still life set up using some antique canning jars and some antique uh, bottles that I've collected over the years. The, th the key thing in lighting a still life is to have one light source from the left, and that's a really important thing. If you're going to communicate to your uh, audience, it's easier for them to see things if they're lit from the left. But once you get them set up, continue to turn them and move them back and forth until you get the right highlights, you get the right refractions of light, you get the right colors bouncing around in here so that it has the highest degree of realism and the highest degree of interest to hold your audience's participation in your final product. One of the things that's important in setting up a still life is camera placement. Many people use uh, their wide angle uh, lens and they come right up close to the, uh, the objects in the still life. The problem there is that the wide angle tends to make the objects look pretty wonky and is not how we see things on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm recommending that you back the camera away six to ten feet so you end up using a mid-range telephoto and then you zoom in so that the frame is full of just your uh, still life 
so that you can then end up drawing the highest degree of realism and highest degree of the facts that are in the image of the still life. We've talked about setting up the still life and photographing the still life. I take a lot of photographs and then I put them in my computer and I pull them up on the screen and then I very quickly narrow the field down to only three or four images that I think may make the best still life. That's based on not only the, the overall composition, but how the light reflects and refracts off the different objects there. It's very, very difficult to see all of those things through the camera, but on the screen you get a much better sense of what's going to make a good painting. Let's be real straight on this. A really fabulous photograph doesn't often make a really great painting. So you've got to find that photograph that records the level of detail you want to paint, but is also aesthetically pleasing and also core to what we're doing is communicating to our viewer the story we want to tell about these objects. It may just be a very simple story, but it may be, and we'll see as we get into this, it may be a little more complex of story about color. It may be a more complex uh, story about how things reflect into each other. We'll discover those as we get into the painting. This is the photograph that I've selected for us to paint today. It's one of many that I shot uh, in, when I had the setup for the still life. I typically, on a small painting like this, We'll use an 8.5 by 11, which is what this size is. I never use a 4 by 6 or a 5 by 7. There's just not enough detail that you can see to be able to translate that onto your painting. While I'm looking at this uh, photograph, I realize that the highlights at the tops of these jars were pretty washed out. So I went back to my computer and I made this detailed blow up of that part of it so I can pick up more details from this photograph as I paint the overall still life. If I'm doing a full sheet or an elephant sheet, I'll probably use a much larger photograph. This is a 13 by 19 inch uh, print. A little too large to work on for this painting, but it would be ideal for a full sheet painting, particularly if it was a horizontal format. Next, I'd like to share with you uh, how I get to the drawing of the still life. When I first started uh, painting, I knew how to draw and I was trying to get to the watercolor painting faster and so I started using different kinds of projection system. And then I realized that it became very important in the realism that I was painting because I could get a much higher resolution of the image of the still life if I projected it. And then if I traced it, then I could even get a higher resolution of imagery before I started painting. And then I realized that if it wasn't on the drawing, there's probably a pretty good chance that it wasn't going to end up in the painting. So let me talk a, a little bit about what pencils to use. It sounds like it's not important, but I find that it'd be very important. I use a 2H lead in a mechanical pencil, and I do that for a couple of reasons. The 2H lead has been used for hundreds of years by architects and engineers because it lays down a very light line, but a, light, a line that's relatively easy to see. It also erases very easily. But the primary reason that you want to use a 2H, that is it, it leaves the least amount of carbon on the uh, watercolor paper, and so it doesn't, if you're putting yellow down, it won't turn green. But if you'd used a number two pencil, or an F lead, or a 6B, then you might end up green rather than yellow. So uh, the other reason to use a uh, mechanical pencil is you don't have to stop and, sh and sharpen it, and the width of the line is always consistent through the drawing. 
You need to develop three weights of line when you're drawing. One, two, and three. The middle one being a medium weight line that you use to outline the objects in the still life. The number one line is your lightest line and you do that to do the details in the objects in the still life. And then the third one is the heavy weight line and you do that to mark those things that you really know later that you want to put masking fluid on and be sure that they end up being the lightest, brightest sparks in the painting. So let's go take a look at how to do this. I use a projected image. When I first started painting, I used a projected image because I was trying to get to the, the, the painting part of doing a watercolor the fastest. I know how to draw and I, I can draw very accurately. But what I found was that in using a projected image, I could get a lot more detail into my drawing because the projected image, particularly today, since we have so, these high resolution instruments we can use, when I first started uh, using opaque projectors and overhead projectors, it was very, very difficult to get a lot of detail in my drawing. But we'll see in a minute these new high uh, resolution projectors make it a lot easier and we can get a lot more uh, detail into our realism uh, paintings. You see that I'm using a, a very high resolution uh, LED uh, projector. I particularly like this. Not only does it have such a fabulous high resolution, but I can put my uh, photo, on, uh, my JPEG, on a stick, plug it into the projector, and project it onto the wall. You see that I have attached my paper to the wall. You want to be sure that it's secure at all points. And in fact, you may want to even put some tape all the way around uh, the paper. That would be particularly important in a full sheet so that the sheet doesn't move at all. Another important thing is to use a piece of paper under the ball of your hand because for several reasons. One is you don't want the oil from the ball of your hand to come off onto the paper and that might cause some problems later in your painting and you also as you get into the drawing you don't want to smear the graphite that's on the paper. I usually start at the upper left and draw all the way over to the lower right. What I'm doing now is using my number two medium weight line to outline the objects that are in the still life. And the great thing about it is by tracing this, it, it's very, very accurate. So if you were somebody that worried about perspective or relationships of the objects in the still life, this solves all those problems for you. Now you get a sense of that. Now I'm going to use my light, my heavy, heavy line to come in and pick up these highlights. That the things that I want to be sure that I put masking fluid on as we go through the process of creating the painting. Now then I'll drop back to my lightest line and pick up those details that I want to be sure that I paint. I found over the years that if it is not in the drawing, there's a probably a pretty good probability it won't end up in the painting. So you want to be sure that all of these details are drawn, even if in the end you don't actually uh, paint them. Now let's look at a finished drawing to see what we've accomplished. Here's the drawing using the 2H. Uh, lead in the mechanical holder and it's a pretty light uh, drawing as you can see. It's perfectly adequate for painting but for the camera's purposes I have drawn a much darker uh, image of the still life 
particularly so you can see how I've darkened around all those little areas that I want to mask out later. And also, you can see that middle line weight that's around each of the objects in the still life. Now, what you're going to find is that while you have worked really, really hard to get as much detail in your drawing as possible, you're going to find that there's even more detail to be seen. So I suggest at this point bringing a, a large photograph. I'm working with an 8.5 by 11 photograph here. I do not recommend that you use a 5 by 7 or a 4 by 6. The larger the photograph, the, the more detail you're going to be able to see and therefore transfer into your drawing. So at this point, go over every inch of the photograph and see that you have transferred all of the, that information from that photograph into the drawing. Once you get that completed, you know you're ready to start painting. Let's take a couple of minutes and review the fundamental materials we're going to be using on the creation of this still life. As we move forward, I'll be introducing all kinds of specialty materials, but let's go over the fundamentals. Paper, paint, and brushes. I use Fabriano 300-pound soft-pressed paper. Fabriano is the only paper company that does a soft-pressed finish. Many of you may prefer to use a cold-press uh, finish. I like the soft press finish because its hills are lower and its valleys are, are more shallow than your cold press and therefore I can get a lot more detail into the surface of that paper with my fine, fine brushes. But at the same time, this paper is made with long strand virgin cotton so it's very, very white and as, when you need to, you can get the paint into the fibers of the paper and make nice soft edges like creating the curves in, in silver or creating the curves in, in a piece of fruit or a flower. I use 300 pound paper for a number of reasons. No, primarily I use 300 pound paper because I don't want to stretch the paper. I can just put it down and start painting. Now we have to remember that all loose sheet paper comes with a shipping sizing on it. So sometime in the past, I will have taken that paper and sloshed it around in warm water for just a few seconds to take that shipping sizing off and then hang it up to dry. Then I can go to my shelf when I'm ready to paint and pull that paper off, tape it down, be ready to go. The other reason to use 300 pound paper is it's just tougher. There's a lot more you can do to it. I make a lot of mistakes. And Primarily, to take the mistakes off paper, you got to introduce a lot of water, you got to do some scrubbing, you got to do a lot of lifting to get that, those mistakes back off the paper. And a 300 pound paper just bears up better under that kind of pressure. In addition to that, like Winslow Homer, I can come back and use a knife or an X-Acto blade to cut out highlights. If I need a little bitty glint in a piece of silver, I can go in and just cut the the surface of the paper off and lift that. Be tough to do that on a 140 pound paper. You might pretty easily just cut right through the paper. And then the final reason is when I hand a painting to one of my clients who has purchased a painting, it just feels more substantial. It feels like they've really got something, not only just a fine piece of art, but the help and weight and texture of that paper lends itself to the importance of the painting itself. Let's talk about paint. I typically use 12 colors in my palette. Those are my go-to colors. I still have a few specialty colors from other paint manufacturers that I also use in my palette from time to time. And then with each painting, I have a number of specialty colors High, more highly granulated colors, more earth tones, whatever the painting calls for. So I have in my background a lot of colors available to my use, but I try to keep a limited palette out there all the time. In terms of brushes, I use 
two fundamental types of brushes. They're both rounds. A round was created in the mid-19th century by a group of famous uh, English watercolors as the preferred brush to create watercolors. I use the Kalinsky Sable uh, brushes. I prefer to use the Skoda brushes. I like the Kalinsky Sables because they are nice and big in the belly. They hold a lot of paint, but they have the most beautiful points. I can get all kinds of little details. When I first started painting, I was using zeros and double zeros, and I was constantly having to go back to my palette to refill my paints. And then I was taught by members of the Escoda family that if I use their fours and sixes, they still have the same points as the zeros and the double zeros and they hold a lot more paint. So I find myself using a four as pretty much my standard brush these days. It holds a lot of water, but has a fabulous point. The other brushes I use are the synthetic brushes. The reason I use the synthetic brushes a lot is that they are stiffer, and therefore I have even more control in them. So a number four in a synthetic gives me not only a pretty fine point, but also will give me a lot of control in creating those small details that are so important for realism. It's really important to pick a paper, the paint, and the brush that fits your style of painting. Those are the, my choices. They work well for me, but I encourage you to try a number of different kinds of products so that you'll find those that meet your style of painting and your personality. Now let's get into the process of creating this still life painting. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take lightweight tracing paper. I recommend that you buy it in a roll. It's a lot less expensive than buying it by the sheet. And buy the thinnest paper you can. None of this paper is really waterproof. It's really only water resistant, but it may save you all kinds of problems down the line because you don't have to be careful about if you drip into the painting. The water will be caught by the tracing paper and then you can blot it up with your paper towel. So what I'm going to do here is tear the tracing paper it's a lot faster and just as accurate. We don't need to worry about how clean the edges are. We just need it to be able to cover the entire painting. I'm going to clean up some of the edges here. Now the reason I do this is that it's like a surgeon opening uh, uh, the, the covering material about to do an operation. It helps me focus on that part of the painting that I'm going to be working on that day. And obviously, as I indicated, it protects all the rest of the painting while you're doing it. If you're a really careful painter and you never drip, then you can skip this. Uh, part of the process as you move forward, but at least while you're painting with us on the demo, try this. It takes a little more time, but it makes the process of painting those objects move a good bit faster, and you don't have to worry about all these other extraneous mistakes or accidents that might happen. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a animal hair, this is a horse hair brush, uh, but you need an animal hair brush, not a synthetic brush. You can use uh, an animal hair, their fabulous horse hair, uh, house painting brushes. This is a, a desk brush. I've had it uh, since I was in college. It's probably an antique at this point. I'm not even sure they make Palomino uh, desk brushes anymore. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to wipe it back and forth and back and forth a few times over the tracing paper. Because it's animal hair, what that does 
is it, it imparts some static electricity to the tracing paper so it doesn't move while I tape it down. And I'm just going to tape down the corners securely. Now the tape I'm using here is really important. There's a lot of discussion out there about what tape should be used to mask in a watercolor. And what I have found over the years is that the best tape to use is drafting tape. Not artist tape, certainly not masking tape. You know, there are lots of famous tapes out there that go by some great names, but they're not made for this purpose. But I find that drafting tape really, really works well. There are several reasons that drafting tape works well. Number one, it's translucent. And you can see your pencil lines through it. You can't do that with artist tape or masking tape. So you'll see how important that is in a few minutes. But the really important thing is that, that this tape is a low-tack, repositionable tape. And because of that, it rarely does any damage to the surface of the watercolor paper. You can move it around. That was the reason that architects and engineers have used it for a couple of hundred years, because they reposition their paper on their drawing surface many times uh, over a day. They could keep using the same tape and do no damage to the paper that they were drawing on. The third reason, and maybe the overriding reason to use the drafting tape, is that the molecules of the tape are so small that once it's put in place, water can't move between the molecules of the glue to get under the tape. Now we'll find as we go into it, there are several variations of how you use that, but those are the fundamental reasons why I highly recommend you add drafting tape to your toolbox. Now when you go to the art store and you ask them for drafting tape, they're probably not going to know what you're talking about because it's not in the art department. It's over in the department where the architects and the engineers uh, buy their supplies. So go look for the triangles and the T-squares and that's where you'll find the drafting tape. You'll recall when we talked about doing the projected uh, tracing of the image, how important different line weights were and the different leads you used to to create those depths of lines. We have one more to add to that uh, party. What we have now is we have the tracing paper covering your line drawing. And remember that I said you needed a middleweight line to outline all of the different objects in the still life. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take an F lead. And it's a really soft lead. And I'm going to draw a line about an eighth of an inch outside of the object. And I'm using the F lead because it's soft, it puts down a very discernible line, but you don't have to press very hard so it doesn't make a mark in the watercolor paper. Very important. You don't want to have any vestige of your drawings in the watercolor paper. So as you can see now, I have this snuff bottle, and we're going to re refer to each of these bottles uh, by their first names. The snuff bottle, the Bromo seltzer bottle, the canning jar with the metal top, and the ball jar. So we'll all be on the same page as we walk through the process. Now I'm going to take some mat board and slide it between the tracing paper and the watercolor paper. Now you can see very, very, very clearly the outline around the snuff bottle. So now I'm going to take my X-Acto knife. Again, I want to emphasize having a fresh, sharp blade. And now I'm going to cut about an eighth of an inch around my drawing. I do that for a couple of reasons. In the, I'm trying to create about a quarter of an inch between the snuff bottle and the tracing paper so that the tape
can stick adequately to the tracing paper. And I also want to be sure that I remove all of the graphite that I put down on the tracing paper because I don't want any of that graphite left near where I'm going to be painting. So I remove the tracing paper off the snuff bottle and I take out my mat board. I want to point out that I'm using an eight ply mat board to be sure that I don't cut through the mat board and in any way cut the paper that I'm painting on. Now I go back to my drafting tape and you might be tempted to make all these curves by doing lots of little bitty pieces of tape, but you don't want to do that because every time you have a joint in the tape, you risk a leak. So what you want to do is have as few pieces of tape as possible to cover your subject so you have the fewest amount of potential leaks. And in this particular case, you should be able to do it in four pieces of tape. Now we take our X-Acto blade and here's where that medium line weight really pays off. You can very easily see where the edge of that snuff bottle is. So I'm going to cut right on the edge of that snuff bottle to expose it for painting. One of the th reasons I like to use old antique jars for doing this is they don't have very precise edges, so you get to add a little character to it while you're at this stage. I can wiggle a little bit around the edges and around the sides of these old jars because that's in the end how they were made. They were mostly blown or in pretty crude molds. All right, now that I do that, what I do is I, I use the back edge of the X-Acto blade to lift up the drafting tape and pull it off the paper. If you use the sharp edge, all you do is cut through the paper, but if you use the back edge, it lifts the paper up pretty easily. Now what we want to do is we want to take our tip of our finger because the tape is adhering to the watercolor paper. It does that pretty easily, so we just need a light burnishing with our fingertips to be sure that we seal the edges of the tape around the object we're going to paint. Now we've exposed that object. We're ready to go to the next step which is going to be masking fluid. There are a lot of masking fluid products out there. Uh, you're going to choose, hopefully, the one that you're most familiar with and has the most success for you. For me, I use the Daniel Smith product for a couple of reasons. The primary reason is that it dries a light beige, a very neutral beige gray. I find a lot of the products that are turquoise and green and blue tend to fight with the colors that I'm trying to put onto my watercolor. And so I appreciate the fact that this masking fluid is a very neutral color and I don't have to worry about guessing what colors are next to it and what color is influencing what the paint that I'm putting on the, uh, the watercolor. Now, the tube comes with a pretty nice applicator. All you do is you cut out off the tip with a 45 degree angle and for pretty large areas this is an ideal uh, applicator. But in some of the small areas that we're going to be uh, applying this, particularly these little bitty highlights and these small lines, you need a finer applicator. The good news is that the Daniel Smith masking fluid comes with five of these very, very sharp little applicators. I find that they tend to 
with the pressure that you put on to get the fluid out of the jar, they tend to slide off the end. So I put a little bit of drafting tape to hold it in place so I don't have to worry about that. Now critical to using any kind of masking fluid is to start the flow of the fluid on a scrap piece of paper before you try to do it on your painting. There are several reasons for that. You need to be able to control the flow of the fluid out and if you're pushing a little too hard it's going to rush out and you certainly don't that, want that to happen onto your painting itself. The other reason is that there may be an air bubble trapped in here and again you don't want that big air bubble sitting there in the middle of your painting. Now neither of those are a disaster. All you have to do is wait till they dry, remove them, and start over. It just is a waste of time. So what I use are little post-it notes. They're easy to keep around, they're inexpensive, easy to, to get rid of, and so I start the flow on the post-it note. Most highlights in glass have sort of three characteristics. They're dots, or they're short lines, or they're flares, like this one that then lead off into lines. Now, this This is where realism really starts to take hold in your watercolor. You have to be really careful about what you mask, but at the same time, don't overmask. This is a really classic opportunity where less is more. I see my students covering the whole two-thirds of the paper with masking fluid. No, you only want to mask those things that are really important to either be white at the end of the painting or they want to be very, very light in a dark field so you may want to save them and then hit them later with just a little bit of color. And this little applicator is great for these little bitty lines and then it is taper off at the end. But it's amazing how these little dots that show up every now and then in, in the light reflecting around in the object make a difference. Now, part of the great joy of doing a still like this is finding how things are reflected back and forth. What we have here is a reflection of the top of that jar into this little bottle. So very important to telling the story of the light relationship between these objects. And here's one of those examples of where I want to save a little area where later I'll come back and add some bright, bright orange to it to define the light reflecting around in that jar. Same thing down here. This little light is being picked up from somewhere in the back from a reflection, but I want to be sure I save it. And then there's some, some things here that I didn't necessarily see when I was doing my projected drawing. So I'm going to come back and add just a few of these little dots that will add interest to the painting. And 
And usually you'll find down at the base, there's some reflection from whatever the jars are sitting on. So if you can save those little corners and just a little bit of masking fluid would do that, it will add a, a little extra finish to the bottom of the jars. All right, as I said, doesn't take a lot, but every one of those dots will add to the story you're trying to tell about this snuff jar as part of this larger still life composition. Now, let's spend a minute and let this dry, and then we'll come back and talk about painting. When I start the painting process, I come in and I put a little warm water in each of the wells of my palette. I want to re-emphasize the fact that I use warm water to paint with. Either warm water or tepid water, not hot water, and certainly not the cold water that comes from your tap. You remember the uh, second law of thermodynamics, I'm sure you remember this, it's things tend to go into a liquid the warmer the liquid. In this case, in waking up and in creating rich wells full of paint, it all happens faster, smoother if you use warm water. So now I'm going back and adding a little bit more warm water to each of the wells or to those few wells that I might be using that day. The other thing is every time I go to clean my water containers, I will be sure to use warm water. We're going to work left to right in this painting. That's if you're right-handed, because you do that, you, you don't want to be carrying brushes full of wet paint over an area that you've already painted, even though it is protected by the tracing paper. If you're left-handed, obviously it works the other way. I point out that when I'm adding water to my paints, I use a little plastic squeeze bottle. This is a batiking tool here, and I like it for its size, its maneuverability, and I also like the fact that it has a little metal tip. They come in several different size openings, so I can either get a steady flow of water, or I can get just a dot or two at a time, so I can control the amount of water that I need at any one time on my palette or in my painting. Now I'm going to start painting with a number six Kalinsky, nice soft brush. But still gives me a lot of control. I selected it just for the size of the bottle that I'm going to be painting. I'm going to start with an under painting here, a color that will penetrate the paper, seal the paper, allow the other paint applications to go on more easily, but it also is a color that will impact whatever colors that I put on top of it and give this little snuff bottle a little bit of a glow. So I'm going to use two colors to use underneath here. I'm going to use my quinacridone gold, a pretty standard color over the years for a, a nice rich uh, orangey gold, and then I'm going to use the new Aussie red gold that Daniel Smith ha has created. Uh, and you'll see that it's a very rich, wonderful, here it is. Isn't that a gorgeous, gorgeous color? And it will allow this old bottle to have a really wonderful new life. I'm going to reach over here and get some of my quinacridone gold to do at the bottom. It's a little deeper than the Aussie gold. And as you can see, all of these 
jars get a little darker as they move down away from the source of the light. Doesn't have to be a beautiful wash. We're just trying to, again, seal the paper and get some colors underneath here that will impact the final product. All right, now we need to let that dry a few minutes, get into the fibers of the paper. Now we let this undercoating dry uh, almost completely. It's still a little wet in the paper, which is fine because I want some of these colors to blend. There aren't any hard edges in any of the colors in the jar itself. So if, if we're lucky, the paint's gonna do a lot of the work for us. We just gotta put the paint in the right places and the right amount of moisture and let it do its, its own thing. So I'm gonna use a number eight brush and a number six brush. I hope you'll notice that I almost every time uh, I, you know, it's one of those things where you good practice and sometimes you get in such a hurry you even forget your own good practices. But I always try to have a paper towel in my hand uh, because there are always accidents that are going to happen. Or you need to pick up a highlight and you don't want to have to go looking for your paper towel. So my strong recommendation to you is always have a paper towel in, in your hand. I always try to have a second brush in my hand so I can do lifts, I can do all kinds of other things with that, uh, with that second brush. So I'm going to start laying in some pretty heavy colors here. Uh, what I'm going to be using is quinacridone burnt orange, I'm going to be using quinacridone burnt scarlet, and then I'm going to be using some, uh, in the darkest, darkest areas, I'm going to be using some burnt umber and maybe even some uh, neutral tint tending in the really dark, dark black areas. Now, I'm using neutral tint as a black in the major objects of the still life. It will look very, very black as we paint it. But when we lay in this really, really rich black background color, it will lighten up those blacks to where they will be as we see them in the photograph. They will stand forward of that black background. Joseph Albers taught us over the years in the theory of color that it's not so much the color that you look at, it's the color that's next to it which creates the real effect that your eye will see. All right, I'm gonna go into my burnt orange Burnt scarlet here. Now let's try some burnt orange across the. Yeah. Nice, rich, rich color. I'm picking up some water, pushing this around a little bit, lightening it up. We're just going to be building up layers and layers and layers of color until we get to that point where it looks, the painting looks just like the bottle.
And we've got a lot of water in here, so some of this may at this stage look a little dark, but it's going to dry a lot lighter than what it looks like here. Okay. I'm just getting rid of some of this moisture down in here because I'm about to lay in some pretty heavy paint that I want to sit still. I think what I've successfully done here is now identify all the major dark areas that need to be defined in this painting. Some of them work top to bottom, some of them just work in sporadic areas within the painting. And because the painting is very wet, I don't have to worry so much about brush strokes. I can just lay the paint in and let the, the paint do the work. reach over and get some of this nice rich oh yeah this is the uh, burnt umber again going on really really dark but again we got a lot of water in this paper it's going to lighten up I'm going to throw a little bit of Garnet Genuine in here just to add a little more color. To the burnt umber. Going back in with just a little bit of my, our, our Aussie gold in here, be sure that it still has that real nice warmth there. You can see that I've saved this highlight down here. I'm going to come back and hit it a little later after it dries around it with a little blue-gray to give it that sort of muted shape to it. I don't want it to be as obvious as it looks at this stage of the painting, but I'll be able to adjust that as I come back later. Now we want the paint to do a lot of the work here, but at the same time we don't want any obvious blossoms in here, so I'm always on the lookout for when that might happen and catch that before it does. We, we want the watercolor to work, but we don't want it to 
not be a positive effect. Now let's let that dry just a little bit and come back and see where we need to come back in and drop even some darker colors into the mix. Okay. We've let the painting dry again the paper is still wet. You can tell that there's still a little puffiness in the paper, but that's okay. That will serve us well because, as I said earlier, we want this paint to blend. We don't want any, any hard edges uh, except for in a, a couple of places, obviously, and that's where we have done the masking. Now I'm picking up some of the details in the painting. A little bit of red down there. A little too much red, but that's okay. That's why I have my paper towel in my hand. Now I'm going to pick up a little bit of neutral tint. I'm going to mix it with a little bit of cerulean. And then I'm going to come down here take most of that highlight down a notch. There we go. Now, much more true to the jar. Now I'm going to go back into my neutral tint as black, and I'm going to come in here and add
edge back over and just get some of those deep browns to soften up the edges of this black. All right, we're going to let that dry just a minute, and then we'll come back and take off the uh, masking fluid. Okay. Now we're going to remove the masking fluid that has protected the whites of our paper. To remove it, I'm going to use a rubber cement eraser. Pretty fundamental tool out there, but there's really not anything else I find that works quite as well as this. I see a lot of people using their fingers. Uh, that works too, but uh, you put a lot of masking fluid on there, you're probably going to rub a blister on your finger. So uh, let me suggest that you use a uh, rubber cement eraser. It starts out being uh, a square, but over the years it wears down. One of the things to be careful about uh, using a rubber cement eraser that the masking fluid as you remove it will build up on the edge of the rubber cement eraser. So every now and then you want to come in and take that off because when it builds up there on there it will impede the collection and the removal of the masking fluid on the paper. So let me go ahead and start working into Now what you want to do, you can see how that is, is building up on the edge of the eraser. You want to take that off so it will continue to remove the masking fluid cleanly. Now, to be sure you've got all the masking fluid off of the painting, you want to take the tip of your finger and very lightly rub it over the surface because then you, will, you can't see all the masking fluid because a lot of it's covered up by paint. But you'll be able to feel the rubbery substance still left on the paper. There's a good bit right across there that had been covered with paint. And there it is revealed. There's some down in that corner, a little bit in that corner. Okay. Uh huh. 
All right, I think we've got it. Now here's a really, really important part of the sequence of painting realism and, you, and using uh, masking fluid. This looks pretty raw, and it is raw. So it's going to take some tempering in order to bring it back down to the reality of the jar. And so what we want to do is we want to take one of our fine brushes. I'm going to use a number two. I'm going to wet it, and I'm going to use primarily just a very, very light gray from my, uh, from my neutral tint. And I'm going to come in here and paint some of these. This is the reflection of that jar, remember. So it, ha it fades over. And that part of it is the reflection from the string. So we need to add just a little bit of the string color in there. There we go. I'll take a little bit of my Aussie gold and I'm going to hit some of these highlights that we saved back in here. Remember I said we'd be saving hi some highlights just to paint later because we wanted them to be nice and light in the painting. Here's one of those really important ones down here. I'm going to get a little bit of cadmium red in here, to give it the kind of life I want. There we go. See, there's that. I'm going to even pull a little bit of that paint back off that left end, make it a little bit lighter. Now mostly what I'm going to do with my mid-range grays, I'm going to go in and just adjust the size and shape of all these so they are more like that that is in the reality that we're copying here. Because it's very, very difficult to have such a degree of control of the nibs of your uh, applicator that you get it exactly right first time and every time. Here again, these are some of these highlights that I wanted to save as lighter color, not necessarily white. And I'm using a little bit of my Aussie gold to paint them. I'm going to come back out and reduce the size of these two. I'm going to lay in a little Aussie gold on them because they're a little too, too bright. Now, moving on up, I'm going to just adjust the shape of some of these. Take out a little, some of those little blobs that happen when we apply masking fluid. But if you're going to paint in realism, it's these little things like this that make all the difference in the world. Like this little one right here is nice and white, but he's pretty small. So we reduce him down to the size he needs to be.
All right, see, with just a little bit of touch up there, we have now reduced those big areas, relatively big areas, of masking, where we did the masking fluid, back to shapes that really fit in to the reality of the little snuff bottle. Have you ever looked at an object and said, I wish I could paint that? Wishing you could make a painting look exactly like what you're seeing? It's called realism. Realism is making paintings of subjects that look real, yet still have that artistic flair. There's nothing quite like seeing something spectacular and thinking, I want to paint this as I see it. Yet there's nothing quite as frustrating as realizing that you don't know how. Even if you're an accomplished painter, it's so easy to lose that sense of real when translating something to paint. Some are overwhelmed and don't even try, yet it often boils down to small tricks few artists have ever been taught. But you don't have to be overwhelmed, and now you can paint what you see. Inspired by the Dutch still-life painters of the 16th and 17th centuries, watercolor master Lauren McCracken has made it his life's mission to capture the beauty of objects in spectacular detail. He's been highlighted in all of the top magazines, featured in all the top shows, won all of the top awards, and is considered one of the best watercolor artists on earth. In fact, Lauren McCracken is so sought after, he travels the globe teaching watercolor skills, and he just returned from teaching in China, where watercolor dominates the art scene. Imagine taking a photo and knowing with confidence that you have the skills to turn it into a realistic painting. Welcome to Watercolor Realism, Glass and Wood with Lauren McCracken. Lauren walks you through every step of his painting process from start to finish. He shows you exactly which tools will make the difference in your watercolors, from your brushes to your paper and how to use them properly. Painting glass is considered one of the most difficult skills as an artist, yet Lauren makes it easy to understand and simplifies the process. And painting wood comes in handy for every painter. And what we're gonna be doing over the, the period of this video is I'm gonna show you the techniques that I use to create my brand of realism. You'll learn how Lauren makes every step of a glass and wood painting so you can repeat the process with any subject matter while you paint along. You can apply these techniques to any realism subject, not just glass and wood. You'll truly be astounded by the level of realism possible in your own paintings. This is the first time Lauren McCracken has ever revealed these techniques on video. Watercolor Realism Glass and Wood with Lauren McCracken Available on DVD or digitally to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order your copy today. Hope you're enjoying these videos and enjoying that segment from Watercolor Realism Glass and Wood. We're going to give you another segment right now. Now we're going to move on to the little blue bottle, which is a Broma Seltzer bottle from the turn of the century. Uh, when you have a setup like this and there's enough separation between one of the objects and the next objects, I don't take the time to take everything off and put on new tracing paper and tape everything. I just take, go ahead and remove the tracing paper around the next, next object do the masking, and go ahead and do the painting, which is what I'm going to do now. I'm taking my very, very soft pencil, drawing an eighth of an inch around the object, now I'll take my mat board, slide it under the edge of the tracing paper. One of the interesting things about using a piece of mat board it has that beveled edge on it and it makes it a little easier to get it under the tracing paper. Just a hint there. Now I use my X-Acto blade and I cut roughly an eighth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch or so outside 
of my pencil line doesn't have to be very exact, just has to be clean. Remove that, remove my mat board, and now I'm ready to do my masking. Again, I emphasize using as few pieces of tape as possible, and again, in this case, should be able to do it in four pieces. One at the top, one at the bottom, and one on each side. Piece of cake. Now, back to my exacto knife. I'm going to cut right on my medium weight line from my tracing. Now, one of the things to watch for in jars of, of any type is that from this period they were formed in molds and so those that have writing on it that are part of the glass because remember back then it was easier to mold it into the glass than to put a sticker on it there are protrusions very very slight protrusions where these letters are raised so as you run across them in particularly the edges and I'll show you in just a second coming up the other side where this happens a couple of times. There's one right here, so I'm going to go out just a little bit and come in, and then I'm going to come up here, and this is a fairly obvious one up here. Because it's little things like that that add to the realism that we're trying to achieve here. Again, using the back side of my blade, I lift. Ooh, didn't go all the way up. Okay, now using the back side of my blade, I'm lifting the uh, drafting tape. Came off nice and cleanly again. Using just my fingertip, I'm going along and be burnishing the edge just lightly to be sure it's adhered to the watercolor paper all the way around. I'm going to put my detail nib back on my masking fluid, tape it back in place. I make a really important point here when we're talking about having lettering or signage or anything like that on an object that we have in realism in our still life. Uh, this applies to whether it's a, a jar that has raised lettering on it or uh, a paste-on advertisement or anything. You tell yourself when you're painting realism that you need to paint all those little letters in perfect shape. There'll be a time or two when you may have to do that, but that's an, on the whole, not the way your eye sees things, and that's not the way light works on most objects. We have this lovely Bromer Seltzer bottle, and you could pick it up, and you could trace out every little letter around here, Bromer Seltzer, Emerson Drug Company, Baltimore, Maryland. But if you look at the photograph, that's not what's there. Bromo is mostly there. But seltzer is mostly obscured, and as you go down, only a few of these letters are defined. So what we want to do is paint the realism that is actually there and that you see in your eye, not what you see in your mind's eye. It goes back to Thoreau's point. It doesn't matter what you look at, it's what you see that matters. And in many cases, your mind may think you see something, but that your eye really doesn't see it that way. And that's the, the difference between sort of make-believe realism and true realism. It's like taking that mug and turning it so the handle is away from you. 
nine people out of 10 that want to draw that mug will paint it with the handle on it because that's the way their mind sees a mug. And then you point out that you don't actually see the handle on the mug, then you ask them to draw it again, and they draw it without the handle, just the volume of the mug. So take that attitude when looking at the lettering on anything, and particularly on bottles where light is moving around the objects, not only the total bottle, but around the objects of the individual letters. So this is a good point to put that thought into application when you're doing your masking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the top and there's some really interesting and critical masking at the top to define the opening because this is one of the few places where you'll actually see the opening at the top of the bottle in this particular still life. And that, the reason is that is because the bottle itself is kind of wonky. Over the years, it's been heated and cooled and used and abused, and so it's not a perfect cylinder anymore. these little bitty lines under here, that little bitty highlight is sort of really important to define that little shape that runs across the bottle. And again, being careful about how you put the masking fluid down. One of the things to keep in mind is that the thicker the masking fluid doesn't help. That just takes longer to dry. A very thin layer of the masking fluid, as long as it covers what needs to be covered, is perfectly adequate for your need. Now I'm going to come down to this these lettering, and you'll see that on each of the letters, there are only a very, very few points that have true white highlights. And so I'm being really careful about just finding those. Now there may be other parts of the letter that are lighter or darker than the rest, but the whole letter does not have a highlight on it. And in fact, except for that little bitty highlight right there, there are no highlights on the seltzer part of the words Broma Seltzer. And we come down to Emerson, there's only a little bit of highlighting on a few of the first letters of that word. So again, less is more. It's a heck of a lot easier to have less masking fluid than too much masking fluid. Okay, I've got a little stoppage there, so I'm gonna go back to my paper to be sure I've got a flow. I've got a nice big highlight, sort of out of scale, on the, t on the bottom of the L there, but that is what is truly there, so that's what we will indicate. Then we've got a few little highlights down here at the bottom that are worth saving. And again, we've got a few highlights that we're going to paint light colors, but we want to save them as this part 
And some of these are on the letters. Some are just shapes in the glass. All right, let's let that dry. Now we've let our masking fluid dry on the Broma Seltzer bottle. Uh, I love to paint this little bottle. I've painted it a few times because it is a study in blues. I'm going to use essentially three blues to paint this bottle. I may come back later and add a little touch of black and a few little punchy details in there and maybe a little some refracted color in there but essentially I'm going to use three colors. I'm going to use my cerulean blue hue, I'm going to use phthalo blue red shade, important, and that ultimate blue of all blues, Prussian blue. Uh, just probably one of the richest colors on anybody's uh, palette out there. So I'm going to start out by just laying in a nice base of cerulean. Now cerulean is a really interesting color uh, in that it takes a good bit to wake it up and to get it moving. It's, it's a pretty granular uh, paint, not, not as granular as manganese or some of the other blues, but it has a pretty good range of color once you get it awake and moving, and obviously this is in great, great shape here. Again, letting it get a little bit darker as it moves down the bottle. Okay. Now, let me just pick up a little bit over here. Okay. Now, I'm going to throw some of this thalo and the other thing I like about the Thalo red shade, particularly here, I see a little bit of a purple cast in this, in this blue bottle. And the, uh, the Thalo blue red shade will give us pretty much all we need in that. So I'm just going to let it drop in a few places again. We want the, the water to do as much of the work as possible. I think I'm going to reach over here in my violet and purples and add just a little bit just for interest. See? Particularly up here at the top. This is a great thing about being an artist. You get to play with all these things. Your reality isn't going to match somebody else's reality. And that's the fun of it. All right. You can see that these, these shapes in this bottle are really loose and they're all blending together. So we, that's a great opportunity for us to let the watercolor do all the work. All we've got to do is bring the, the paint right to the right point. And I'm dropping in a little bit of uh, Prussian. This is so wet that I'll probably have to come back and 
bring some more of that purple and some more of that Prussian in, but that's okay. Don't mind doing that at all. All right, let's let that dry a few minutes and we'll come back and add one more layer on top. We've let the paint dry a bit on the uh, Broma Seltzer bottle, so now we're coming back to our last pass with our darker uh, blues. I'm going to start with some of this uh, phthalo blue red shade. Pointing out that I'm using a scrap of the watercolor paper that I'm actually painting on to test my colors uh, as I apply them to the painting. That's really, really important to be sure that whatever color you're using is actually the color that you need, not what you think is on your brush when you pick it up. And this is where we're starting to add the real details. Everything else we've done so far, while important, was just building this base. And I want you to notice that I have taken my photo and brought it over as close as I could to the area that I'm actually doing, where I'm actually doing the painting. Because I found that even a distance from here to here, you can lose the detail in your thought process. So if I can bring it over just as close as possible, and have the least amount of distance to move my eye, I can have a better opportunity of including a higher level of detail in my painting. Here I'm starting to paint around some of the letters so that the lighter blue will give the letters some substance.
I'd be lying if I didn't say that having a steady hand is pretty essential to doing a high degree of, of realism. And I'll repeat something I heard said earlier is that the more accurate your drawing from your tracing, the more accurate your painting is going to be. And if it's not in the drawing, it's a pretty high probability that it won't end up in the painting. Now it's right in here that the letters start to get pretty blurred. And don't become very specific. And that's what you want. Because your eye is not seeing them in really high, high, high detail. Here in the lettering of Maryland, it's really the letters themselves that have the color in them, not the space around it, as it happens in so many of the of the other letters in the 
in the sides of this wonderful jar. Just a couple of really dark areas. I'll hit them with uh, some uh, Prussian blue. point out again that I haven't done a lot of deep of effort to make every little detail in every letter. I've only given you an, the, the viewer enough information where then they can go in and if they have an interest and hopefully what you've done is you brought them into the painting to the degree they want to have that kind of closer look, their gestalt, their viewing of the painting can help fill in the rest of that information. And that's a good thing because you want to get your viewer involved in your painting. Now, if there's one little bit of just black on here, don't know how important it is, but I'm going to put it in. It's just right there. Seems to me that's important. All right, let's give it a minute to dry, and then we'll remove the... Uh, masking fluid and finish up the Promozeltsa jar. Now we're giving those colors an opportunity to dry completely. So I'm going to go in and out and take my rubber cement eraser and remove all of the dried masking fluid. And paying attention to the excess that builds up on the edge, which will impede getting the rest of it off cleanly. And using the tip of my finger, running over the whole surface to be sure I've gotten all the little bits. Okay, now it looks a little rough and a little stark, but we knew that. Now we're going to take our fine brush and come in here, soften some of these edges that we just saved because we wanted them to be light. Take a little bit of my phthalo blue in here and just clean up some of the edges. I want this to look like a flare, not just a big wad of masking fluid. And again, we want to reduce the size of some of these just to get them back into scale with the object. 
the jar itself. This is a pretty classic highlight on a jar. You can see that there's a flare in the center and then it tapers off on either side. It comes in two or three different basic fundamental shapes, but you see it in almost every piece of glass. See how this is beginning to look more risk, more realistic, more like the real jar, and how the letters are seen there. Again, a lot of these things that we masked out with the uh, masking fluid, we didn't intend for them to be white. We intended them to be much lighter in color than the, in the blues, and, it was, and it's a lot easier to paint them if you mask them out and then come back and subdue them later. Now, if you ever have the opportunity to go to Baltimore, you're going to find that there's a big clock right in the middle of town that is advertising Bromo Seltzer. And for many generations, if you work downtown in Baltimore, you really didn't even have to have a watch because the Bromo Seltzer uh, clock in the middle of town pretty much ran the entire downtown. Everybody knew exactly what time it was by the chiming of the Bromo Seltzer clock and being able to look up at the Bromo Seltzer block and see what time it was. two little bitty touches and I think we'll have it. I'm going to come around and just give a little bit of a softening of the edge. In fact, I'm going to reach over and get, this is a pretty stiff nylon brush and I'm going to use it to soften the bottom edges here. There we go. That looks a little more natural. Now what I did on the other side in order to make that highlight even come out further into uh, the foreground is I put a little bit darker blue than it may be necessary on there but that pops that highlight out. Spread that out a little thinner in there.
Okay, that's our bromo seltzer but jar. Well, that's Lauren McCracken from Watercolor Realism, Glass and Wood. If you're a still life painter, that's the one you want to have. You can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. I want to remind you that this is a time for growing and learning and getting better at your art. You don't want to look back and say, I wasted all this time. Do something to grow. I'm Eric Rhodes. Have you ever looked at an object and said, I wish I could paint that? Wishing you could make a painting look exactly like what you're seeing? It's called realism. Realism is making paintings of subjects that look real, yet still have that artistic flair. There's nothing quite like seeing something spectacular and thinking, I want to paint this as I see it. Yet there's nothing quite as frustrating as realizing that you don't know how. Even if you're an accomplished painter, it's so easy to lose that sense of real when translating something to paint. Some are overwhelmed and don't even try, yet it often boils down to small tricks few artists have ever been taught. But you don't have to be overwhelmed, and now you can paint what you see. Inspired by the Dutch still life painters of the 16th and 17th centuries, watercolor master Lauren McCracken has made it his life's mission to capture the beauty of objects in spectacular detail. He's been highlighted in all of the top magazines, featured in all the top shows, won all of the top awards, and is considered one of the best watercolor artists on earth. In fact, Lauren McCracken is so sought after, he travels the globe teaching watercolor skills, and he just returned from teaching in China, where watercolor dominates the art scene. Imagine taking a photo and knowing with confidence that you have the skills to turn it into a realistic painting. Welcome to Watercolor Realism, Glass and Wood with Lauren McCracken. Lauren walks you through every step of his painting process from start to finish. He shows you exactly which tools will make the difference in your watercolors, from your brushes to your paper and how to use them properly. Painting glass is considered one of the most difficult skills as an artist, yet Lauren makes it easy to understand and simplifies the process. And painting wood comes in handy for every painter. And what we're gonna be doing over the, the period of this video is I'm gonna show you the techniques that I use to create my brand of realism. You'll learn how Lauren makes every step of a glass and wood painting so you can repeat the process with any subject matter while you paint along. You can apply these techniques to any realism subject, not just glass and wood. You'll truly be astounded by the level of realism possible in your own paintings. This is the first time Lauren McCracken has ever revealed these techniques on video. Watercolor Realism Glass and Wood with Lauren McCracken Available on DVD or digitally to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order your copy today.